pain is a fact of consciousness. It's probably what distinguishes us from robots. They can have sensors and everything, but they don't feel pain. It's our main subjective burden, which is why the Buddha's teachings are such a gift. There's that principle in postmodern thought that every attempt to teach somebody something is an act of aggression. You're trying to make them submit to your view of things. But the Buddha's teachings are a huge exception to that. He didn't force anybody to accept his teachings. He offered them as therapy. You can take them and use them, or you can put them aside, pay them no mind. He didn't need anyone's approval. He didn't need to exert power over anyone, because he already had found true happiness. He was offering his teachings as a gift. So the one problem that everybody has, everyone shares. We don't share our pain. I don't feel your pain, you don't feel mine. When a politician says, I feel your pain, you wonder what he's feeling. But each of us knows what pain is like, and each of us wants a solution to it. The Buddha says that the primary reaction to pain is twofold. One is bewilderment, not understanding why it's there, where it comes from. And the second one is a search. Is there anyone who knows a way or two to get rid of this pain? Particularly with animals and young children who can't speak yet, there's not much comprehension. There's the sensation of pain, there's the definite feeling of pain. But that's a huge question. Why? Why? What is this? Why? Why is this happening? That's the bewilderment. As we begin to find that there are other people who can help assuage our pain, starting with our mother, father, we start looking outside. And there are some pains that they can take care of, but there are a lot of pains they can't. So we look to other people. So the Buddha is there to fill in that gap. Because bewilderment often leads to really mistaken ideas, looking to the wrong people, taking up the wrong ideas about how pain can be overcome. And so the Buddha gives us his expert advice, but he's the kind of doctor, not the kind of doctor who gives us a shot, he's the one who says, okay, you take this prescription. You find these medicines, like an old-fashioned herbal doctor. You find these medicines, and you make them into medicine, and you take it, and you adjust your life. Avoid certain foods. Eat other foods. Avoid certain activities. Exercise in certain ways. In other words, in other words the actual treatment is up to you. He's not going to take the pain away for you, but he does tell you what you can do to overcome the suffering. In particular, he talks about two kinds of pain, two kinds of suffering. There's the pain in the three characteristics, and there's the pain and suffering in the Four Noble Truths. In the three characteristics, it's just something universal, wherever there's the process of fabrication, where conditions come together to create other conditions, there's going to be stress. There's some stress inherent in the fact that things arise and pass away, and that their coming together cannot be permanent. But that's not the suffering that weighs down the mind. It does weigh down the mind because we have craving. But it's the craving that makes all the difference. That's the suffering, that's the pain and the Four Noble Truths. And that's the one that we can do something about. That's the optional suffering. It 
And the path to put an end to that suffering is the Eightfold Path or the, the Threefold Training. Virtue, concentration, discernment. Virtue here starts with our activities in terms of speech and physical activities, but it points to something really important, that those activities are based on our intentions. And the whole purpose of this aspect of the practice, well, there are several purposes. One is that you know, if you harm others, it's going to be hard for you to practice. And simple, the karmic retribution creates difficulties. And there's the regret in the mind when you realize you've harmed somebody or harmed yourself. And as the mind is trying to settle down in concentration, that becomes a thorn, makes it hard to settle down. But at the same time, training in the precepts is also training in mindfulness, training in alertness, training in compassion. In other words, you're developing good qualities of mind, and you're getting very sensitive to your intentions, because it's the intention that determines whether you're breaking a precept or not. And we go through life being so ignorant of our intentions and covering them up with denial, especially the unskillful ones, that when you ask somebody why they did something, often they have to stop and think for a little while and reconstruct it. They weren't really there. as the decisions were being made. So the precepts try to make you more and more present to your actions, more sensitive to the results of your actions. And then the same precept gets carried in, or the same principle gets carried on in the mind. When you're practicing concentration, you want to be very clear that this is an action, this is an activity you're doing. You're thinking and evaluating one object. And you hold a perception in mind. As the Buddha said, this is a, a series of what he calls perception attainments, all the way from the first jhana up through the dimension of nothingness. It's a perception you hold in your mind, a mental label that you apply to things that keeps you in touch with them, like with the breath. There are many things that you could be sensitive to in your awareness of the body right now, but the Buddha is asking that you be a sensitive to the breath the in and out breath and the other breath energies in the body. And just try to stay tuned to that level of awareness, that aspect of having a physical body sitting here. And when he talks about being aware of the body, it's being aware of these, and they also call the four properties. There's the wind property, the fire property, the water property, and the earth property. These are all aspects of how you sense the body from within. The wind is the en energy or motion. Earth is the solidity. Fire is the warmth. Water is the cool sensations that go with the flow of the blood through the body, say. And as you focus on that aspect of your body, you find also that there are feelings of pain or pleasure. And it's important that you learn how to distinguish those from the four properties, because otherwise they get glommed together, especially the earth solidity side of the body. If there's a pain, you tend to glom it on with the solid sensations, which makes the pain seem solid. And right here is an area where you can make some, get some important insights into how the mind, its perceptions can create a lot of problems, because it's that perception of the pain that's being glued to the solid sensations in the body, which makes the pain seem a lot more solid than it has to be. So this is one area where once you start getting concentrated and you can stay with the sense of the body and not keep flying off to other mental worlds. You want to start making distinctions. Which sensations are the earth sensation? Which ones are the water, fire, breath, or wind? And then what sensations are the pain sensation? They're, they're different things. 
when you can see that distinction. You learn how to apply different, different labels to those different sensations. That takes a huge burden off the pain right there, huge burden off the mind. So even though, though there can be pain in the body, the mind doesn't have to be pained by it. You begin to see that the perception is the bridge between the physical pain and the sense of suffering or being burdened in the mind. How does this create craving? Because we lay claim to the body. The whole mass here is us or ours. And as soon as a pain comes in, our, our territory has been invaded. And we have that sense that the pain is aiming at us. It's trying to do something to us. It's trying to move in on our territory. But if you can practice just holding different perceptions in, okay, this is just a pain that's there. It's not invading your territory. When you're not trying to take possession of that territory, then you're not opening yourself up to attack. So that's another level of perception that you want to be able to distinguish. That when you're aware of something, you also tend to take possession of it. It's possible to be aware, but without having that sense of possession. Just as like you're, you're aware of the mountain over there on the horizon, you're aware of the, the sun on the mountain. You're aware of the trees, the chaparral. You look at them and it's, you're aware of them, but there's no sense of possession. It's not yours. And as long as the mountains and the chaparral don't do anything that invades your space, there's no suffering. And then you have to learn how to apply the same perception to the body. Now, if you went out and you tried to take possession of Mount Palomar or Mount Pala, okay, then there'd be problems. But as long as you don't take possession of them, there's no problem. You want to learn how to say, apply that same principle to your sense of inhabiting the body. You can be here, but it doesn't have to be you inhabiting it. There's just this sense of the body that you're aware of. Now to see the movements of the mind is it's applying these perceptions to things and creating the bridges that then allow stress to come into the mind. That requires a lot of stillness. This is why the Buddha said that genuine insights really do require strong concentration. We can have insights about other things without much concentration. You see little movements of the mind here, movements of the mind there in kind of a random way. But the ones that really do go deep into the mind, that really do have an important impact in freeing the mind, those are the insights that come from seeing how you're trying to take control of something so you can gain pleasure out of it, and then it turns around and it bites you. Those are the insights that are really important that make a big difference. For those, you have to be very quiet, because that movement of trying to take over something so that you can feel that you're in control and then it can lead to your happiness or pleasure, it's so instinctive and so under the radar. And there's such an uh, of courseness about it. Of course you would think that this is your body. Of course you would feel this way. Of course you would have those perceptions that they're really hard to catch. This is an important aspect of insight, is learning how to see things with new eyes. Getting out of your old habits of looking at things and understanding things, and then turning around and looking at those old habits and saying, oh my gosh. They caused a lot of unnecessary suffering and stress. So this is an important aspect of concentration practice is to get out of your old habits. Instead of thinking about things as you normally do or focusing on things as you normally would, you hold on to that perception of the breath regardless. The mind may say, this is stupid, you're not getting any insights, I'm sorry, well, 
whether it's stupid or not, I don't care. I'm just going to do this. We're here to learn something new. As the Buddha said, it's to realize what you haven't realized before, to attain what you haven't attained before. That means you have to do things you haven't done before. So you stick with the breath regardless of how tempting it is to go thinking about other things, focusing on other things. You stay right here, stay right here, stay right here. Develop that strength of mind that can stick with something regardless. The image that John Fung liked to use to used to use a lot was the one of a red ant. In Thailand they have these big red ants that will bite, and they'll be so tenacious that if you try to pull the red ant off, sometimes its head will detach before it's willing to let go. He says that's the kind of tenacity you want as you're sticking with the breath, because that rearranges things in the mind, rearranges priorities. The part of the mind says, I'd like to think about this, I want to think about that. You have to say, no, 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 I'm going to stay right here. And in doing that, you get the mind out of its normal conversations, its normal ways of doing things and approaching things. And certainly when you get out of your normal way, that you can turn around and look at the normal way and get some perspective on it. To see that even though the pains of conditions are a normal part of the world. The suffering that the mind takes on is totally optional. It's from our own lack of skill that we suffer. So this is what we're trying to gain insight into. This is why discernment is so important, to see the distinctions that we've otherwise glommed together glomming the pain onto the solid parts of the body, glomming the sense of me onto that pain in the solid parts of the body. So it's this big sticky mess. But when you learn how to distinguish things and make distinctions, see the differences. Say that a feeling of pleasure or pain is not the same thing as a sense of solidity. Or that being aware of the body doesn't mean that you have to lay claim to the body. There can be a sense of separation from the mind and its object. When you can see these distinctions, that's how release comes. Because that threefold training is not the end of the story. It's something called the, the Four Noble Dhammas. There's virtue, concentration, discernment, and release. And it's the Four Noble Dhammas that give a more complete picture of what we're about here. And so you recognize the discernment as being genuine discernment is when the, when release comes. You see something you didn't understand before, you see something you didn't see before, you understand something you didn't understand before, and in the understanding there's a release from suffering. That's the kind of insight we're looking for. Other insights may be useful. This is one of the reasons why John Fung said not to go around memorizing your insights all the time. Because if the insight is genuine, it brings freedom right there. It does something. It's not just information, but it's an insight that makes a difference, serves a purpose, accomplishes something. That's when the discernment is noble and it leads to noble release.